Can you hear me? Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Alex Kosowski, and I am uh, going to present to you today about a new DSR we're working on called the um, EE <coughs> Security API DSR, DSR 375. It's a brand new DSR. Um, I happen to be the DSR 375 specification lead. I also happen to be on the Oracle WebLogic security team, so that's sort of like where I'm coming from with this. Um, I just want to start by saying that uh, what I'm presenting here today is just for informational purposes. Don't make any business decisions based on this. This is like the standard Oracle thing. And um, just, you know, uh, just keep informed that, you know, these are just ideas today that I'm going to present to you. <clears throat> In today's presentation, I want to start by giving you uh, some of the motivations behind the new JSR, um, give you a little introduction to the new JSR. Um, and then most of the presentation will be spent discussing the ideas that we've been talking about in the expert group, just to give you a sense of what we're thinking about and the kind of ideas that we're, um, the kind of direction we're going in. Then uh, we'll talk about how you can get involved if you want to contribute some ideas. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll have some time for questions. So um, why do we need a JSR, a new uh, Java EE security API JSR? It all kind of started with a survey they had last year. Um, this is an EEH survey. At the beginning of the EEH, the EEH cycle, um, the EE platform group presented the survey to the community. There were 4,500 total responses to the survey. And in the end, the results of the survey came out to be this pie chart. Now, at the very beginning of the, <coughs> of the EEH cycle, when a lot of the Oracle um, EE specification leads were gathering and talking about what EEH is going to be, I saw this, this pie chart a lot. Everybody uses this, present, this uh, pie chart in their, in their presentation. And um, what you'll notice in the, present, in the pie chart is that the second most popular and the fourth most popular items are security related. You'll see that um, security simplifications and security interceptors take up about a fifth of the pie chart. And that kind of brought the attention that you know, we ought to get back to this you know, EE security API and clean it up and make it simpler and more modern. When you scan the community um, and look at different blogs, um, one of my favorite bloggers, Arjan Time, is quoted as saying, the ultimate goal is to have basic security working without the need of any kind of vendor-specific configuration, deployment descriptors, or whatever. And Reza Rahman is uh, quoted as saying, the, jo the EE security model is problematic in the cloud pause, oh, cloud pause environments where um, developers do not necessarily have easy access to non-standard vendor runtime features, and a self-contained application is much easier to manage. So what's generally wrong with EE security, Java EE standard security? Java EE security has been viewed as being not portable. It's, it's kind of abstract. The APIs are all very confusing. Um, and it's also antiquated. A lot of it was built back in like, you know, the J2EE days, right? Um, it doesn't really fit the modern cloud app developer paradigm. Um, it requires, usually requires app server configuration. And it also, um, you know, generally speaking, a lot of people have moved on to third-party frameworks, right? So it's losing, values to, losing value to third-party sort of non-standard frameworks. And once people go off to, say, you know, Shiro or, or Spring Security, they're likely not going to come back to, to EE security. So, you know, it's generally losing value in, in the market. So what do we do? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, we have to plug the portability holes. We have to introduce some more modern, um, some more modern uh, concepts such as uh, CDI and expression language, perhaps. And we also want to make it simpler for the app developer community. We want to make it so that um, it's more um, that, that there are common security configurations, don't require server changes, that um, you can have, instead of having XML everywhere, maybe you can have more annotations, and just generally make it a better experience for the application developer. So now I'll go into the new JSR, the new JSR itself. So JSR 375 already has a history. It's a brand new JSR and it has a history. And the reason why it has a history is that I actually proposed this internally to Oracle last summer. Um, I, and, and within Oracle, when you want to have Oracle to, um, to, rep, to sponsor a JSR, there's a process where you have to present the, the proposal to EE uh, architects. You, I, I presented this thing to the, um, the WebLogic security uh, uh, group. And then eventually you have to, of course, present it to management. And I, and I went through this process and uh, eventually Oracle did approve it and we presented it to the JCP and the JCP approved it. And um, in December 2014, um, it was approved by the JCP. Which brings us up to the next stage of the, of the process, which is expert group nominations. In, in this um, GSR, we, it's really kind of API-oriented, so we wanted to make sure that we had an expert group 
that consisted of three major categories of, of experts. First of all, we really wanted to have EE API veterans. We wanted people who had used EE uh, APIs for a long time, were involved in a lot of the JSRs, knew, knew the history behind you know, the, the serverless JSR and, and the EJB JSR. And also, um, a second group of people we were looking for were these people, uh, these de developers and organizations who develop these third-party security providers. Basically, they're solving the pro they've solved the problem that we're trying to solve now, and we want to bring their knowledge into, um, into the JSR. Finally, um, we have the EE platform security implementers, uh, people like myself, people who work for the companies who build the, um, the platform. So we have Oracle represented, Red Hat, and IBM. So in March 2015, last month, um, the expert group started discussions. And currently we have 14 members. I'm not going to name all the names, but there are lots of names here I'm sure you recognize. Um, and they represent those three groups I mentioned. I kind of come, come, I have a little cold. <clears throat> so in the first month, the expert group had this explosion of, act of activity. Um, I mean, you can imagine, it was like a sleeping giant. All these people had these great ideas. You know, a lot of people had complaints about why security sucks, and they really wanted to, to express these ideas, and, and they had a vehicle now to express it. So we had a lot of brainstorming last month. We had 237 messages on our expert group alone, our mailing list. Um, we had 81 commits in our GitHub playground for examples and, and, uh, and, and proposals. And we already have 24 JIRA items in our, um, in our issue list. So which brings us to our next section, the ideas. Now these are all just general ideas. I'm sure when you look at the ideas, you'll find holes in the ideas and how they're incomplete and how they have problems. But this is not, you know, the point of this is just to kind of let you know the ideas that we're coming up with, give you a general sense of the direction. We know we have to develop them, you know. This is just sort of like the result of our brainstorming. So the ideas are broken up in these different categories. Terminology, and then APIs for the authentication mechanism, which is the login mechanism. Identity store, password aliasing, role permission assignment, security context, and authorization interceptors. And if they're just a bunch of words to you, um, here's how they relate to each other. Um, an, auth an authentication mechanism, which is a login mechanism, needs an identity store to get its identities. You have role and permission assignment, um, and that's used by the authorization interceptors to figure out what the permission assignments are. And then you have a security context, which gives you direct access to different areas of the, of the current security framework. And finally, we have password aliasing kind of on the side, which we'll, we'll learn that it really is related to configuration. So terminology. Now you might, want to want, you might wonder why we start out with terminology. You know, this is all about APIs and stuff. And the first week of our, um, of our expert group, we all realized that we had different words for the same thing. I know we were working, you know, um, we, we all, it was just kind of funny because we all knew what we were talking about. We also all knew that we were just referring it in different ways. We also realized that there were different names for the same thing in different containers. And we kind of thought, we're making this unified security API JSR. We wanted to kind of come up with a standard vocabulary and build that vocabulary into our API. So for instance, um, there is something called, you know, when something gets authenticated, you know, what is that something that gets authenticated? Is it a user or is it a caller? If you're in the servlet API, servlet container, HTTP servlet request get user principles needed, so it's a user. If you're in the EJB, EJB container, then you have to use EJB context get caller principles, so it's a caller. So we have a little vocabulary problem there. A group, we had a lot of discussions about group, and it's still going. Um, you know, what is a group? Is it a group of users, or is it a permission, or is it a role? And then this one is actually, today there's discussions on the expert group on this one. Um, what is that something where identities are stored? Right? There are lots of names for this one little simple thing. Uh, we found that there's, the, it's called a security provider, a realm, an auth repository, an auth store, a login module, an identity manager, an authenticator, an authentication provider, an identity provider. So there are lots of names for these same things, and it became really clear that we want to come up with some standard name that would describe it and we can use in our, in our API. So um, next I'm going to talk about the API for authentication mechanism and how we want to simplify it. So the use case here is that applications, these are from applications that manage their own users and groups. And applications need to authenticate users in order to assign roles to these, these users and groups. 
applications would authenticate based on some domain, domain model, application domain model that the server wouldn't know anything about. And um, perhaps an application wants to use some sort of authentication method that's not even supported by the server. You know, maybe you want to be able to install some library in your application that um, you, know, you just want your application to use, the server doesn't support, and you want to have an ability to install this, this library. Finally, um, there are developers who simply want to use a portable authentication mechanism standard that you can just you know, go from platform to platform to platform and not have to worry about tweaking around all the, you know, the scripting or the UI or whatever it is per platform. The current solutions for authentication mechanism, well, of course, is the proprietary server support. Um, there's the third-party security providers that also, of course, provide their own methods of authentication. And then there's something called JASPIC, this thing called the Java Authentication Service Provider Interface for Containers. Does anybody, has it, does people know what JASPIC, if you've heard of JASPIC, raise your hand. Ah, one. Ah, okay. So JASPIC is like this hidden gem. Nobody's ever heard of it. Um, it's actually been around for a while. Um, and what JASPIC is, it's, it's an active um, interface, I mean, active as in it's being developed currently still. It's in a maintenance release. It's uh, JSR 196. The so maintenance release 1.1 1 .1 was released in 2013, and it's still being maintained. What it is, it, it's, a, it's a standardized, portable, thin, low-level framework, authentication framework. It's extensible within an application. You can, actually, you can actually do all the things I just mentioned in JASPIC if you knew how to deal with JASPIC, and if you were actually aware of it. Um, and it, what it does, and this is actually the, the, real, the part that we really like about it, because it saves us a lot of work. Um, it's already integrated into the container and, the, and into the servers. Okay? There's a, there's a, if you are a full EE uh, server, you have to support JASPIC. If, I think if you're a, a web profile, it's optional. Um, but if you support JASPIC, that means that there's already a mechanism in place that allows you to inject um, the users and groups into the server in a, in a server-specific way. Like the, one of the other big problems with, with security in, in EE is that every server has its own definition of a subject, right? Everybody's got their own, their own types of principles and what is the principle implemented and what do they mean? And Jasper kind of gets around that by saying, okay, I've authenticated a user and I have a group, I have users and groups, and now here, here at server, take care of it, populate, I, hand you, I hand you the subject, you populate it, and you come back and you give it to me and I'll use it. So it works. That's all done already. We don't have to worry about that part. And finally, like I said earlier, JASPIC gives you the ability currently to implement any authentication method. At the heart of JASPIC is this thing called a server auth module. It's really a very simple interface. There are only five methods. And, they all, and they're pretty, pretty straightforward. I mean, you have an initialize method. You have a validate request method, which allows you to do the basic validation. I mean, this is like the, all the work's really done mostly in this validate request method. You have a server, a supported methods ty uh, messages type, which is like a meta metadata um, uh, uh, API, secure response, and then some, some lifecycle stuff like cleaning up the subject. So, 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 so far I've described this JASPIC thing. Obviously nobody's heard of it, it's, it's, but it is useful if you knew how to use it. So why, why is it that nobody's really using this now? And I'll tell you why. Because if you want to go and, and develop in JASPIC and install a, a, a server auth module, you have to create six classes. You have to actually literally write code and write six classes. And this has been sort of mentioned in some of the documentation about JASPIC as the factory, factory, factory method. Uh, you know, whatever. So basically what you have to do is you have to create a server context listener class, which then calls into JASPIC and, 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 and calls a, an auth config factory, which registers an auth config provider, which then will have to generate a server auth config, which then produces a server auth context, which then delegates to the server auth module, right? This is why nobody's heard of this thing. So our first simplification I want to mention is we like to change that to be one method. We want to have um, helpers in place to simplify the installation so that all you have to do is create a serverlet context listener. And if you have that one, that one class with the five APIs and this, this helper, you're done. The way that would look in code is we'd have, you know, here's an example. We'd have something like a JASPIC a helper. In this case, it's just called JASPIC. Um, and we have a method called register server auth module, where you provide an instance of your server auth um, module, and then provide, you just pass along the server context to it, and that's it, you're done. If you don't like writing code, 
Maybe we'll have an option for an authenticator annotation. All you do in the annotation is you just supply um, the server auth module as, as the value for the annotation, and you're done. In this case, for example, the server can use the server auth module for authentication, and, and it's all set up. So going back to this server auth module, I did say that there's only five methods, but there are five methods, right? That wouldn't be cool if you didn't have to worry about all these five methods. And there actually is a way around that, too. Um, JASPIC has these profiles, excuse me. JASPIC has profiles, and one of the profiles it has is a, is a, a web profile, a servlet profile. And if you want to take advantage of the profiles, you can actually simplify all these methods down to, to you can make a lot of assumptions or default values with a lot of these uh, methods, and, and make it so that when you want to implement your own server auth module, it really is much simpler. So if we actually implemented, for instance, a helper, there was an HTTP servlet auth module helper that you could derive from. That would actually have all the other methods built in, I mean, all the other implementations of the other methods built into it. And all you would have to worry about to create a SAM, would, that's, that's what we're calling it, server auth module is actually called a SAM in, the, um, in, the, in JASPIC. All you would have to do to create your own custom server auth module would be just implement this validate HTTP request. Now, if you were familiar with JASPIC at all, you'd know that there's a lot of messaging, um, messaging API has really just deals with objects. JASPIC is, is, not, is actually relatively old. It came from, its origins are relatively old, even though it is being currently mod, um, updated. But in the, if we take the assumption that we're dealing only within, in this case, a servlet uh, profile, you can actually, um, you know, bake all that, all that, um, all the casting into the into the uh, superclass, and then um, just have it so that the parameters that come into your valid HTTP request are HTTP servlet request, H HTTP servlet response, and in a context that gives you a sense of where you are in in the current context. So that's another simplification. Now, even if you have only one method, there's a lot of code, right? So. In this example, I have a basic auth um, server auth module, and it's doing some of the things that you'd expect in that one method, right? It's, it's grabbing um, the authorization header, it's parsing the credentials, it's checking the user and password to make sure that uh, you know, it's valid, and then if it's not valid, it calls this last method. Now, you'll see I have highlighted there no callbacks required. If you were to write um, a, a server auth module in JASPIC, as I mentioned, one of the cool things about it is that it automatically talks to the server and injects the uh, users and groups into the server, um, into the into the server, so that the server can build the subject. The problem is that you have the, the bad thing is it has these callbacks, and that to create these callbacks, you have to actually have like five or ten lines of code that creates the callbacks, populates the callbacks, calls the handler. So rather than have those five or ten lines of code, we have it simplified to just being one method called notify container about login, and you can just pass in the user and groups. So again, less code, it's easier, it makes it more attainable and usable by developers. And finally, once we've made all these simplifications, you can do things, like you almost can create a market for these server auth modules. One thing we were thinking about is standardizing one server auth module, which would be for OpenID Connect, so that we can actually use OAuth 2 uh, as, and, and uh, OpenID Connect supported identity providers like Google uh, as a standard out of the box thing in EE8. Finally, in authentication, we were thinking about um, standardizing something called authentication events. These would be standard CDI events that would be hooked into, stand, into certain locations, certain important moments in the authentication process. So for instance, if you wanted to know about, you know, be hooked into right before an authentication occurs, or right after an authentication occurs, or right before a logout occurs, or right after an, a logout occurs, you can observe these events, and then you can do things like track the number of logged in users in your application. You can do things tra like tracking the number of failed login attempts per account. You can do things like have side effects where if you're using some sort of single sign-on mechanism and you want to track a local account that it was just authenticated, you can do that too. Or if you wanted to load some application-specific user preferences after a login, you can do that also. So there are a few ideas here that we can introduce based on newer technologies like CDI. The next area I'd like to talk about is an API for identity store. This is um, where an application, again, manages its own users and groups. It needs access to repositories of identities or, you know, or users, like users. 
these users may be stored in some application-specific repository that the server doesn't know about, like some LDAP. And that you and users, they want to be uh, applications want to manage users without without access to any type of server configuration. This actually was a survey question in that EE8 survey I mentioned. And the question was, should we standardize on requirements for simple security providers? If you look into the text, they mean, they mean identity store, something like identity store. Again, that, the, the whole terminology thing and, and their configuration. And 65.2% and said yes, they wanted to see um, a standard um, identity store type mechanism. Currently, there's no such support in the EE standard. You can only do this through, an app, to, through either proprietary server support or through the third-party security framework providers. So what would it look like? And this is just an example. I, I, can, I already know that probably some of you are looking at this and thinking, oh, why do you have password in there? But um, this would be an example of what you could do to, to identify, to have an identity. And we could standardize something like this, right? So you can you know, get, get, you have certain attributes about the identity that you can get with getters with, for instance, uh, you know, the username, the password, some metadata like is the account expired, is the account locked? And I'm sure you've recognized this thing from you know, Spring Security and, and Shiro, they all kind of have the same idea. And you know, we're definitely inspired by that, right? We definitely want to kind of bake in the things that we know uh, work. Also, there's this, this uh, one method called get attribute, and that might be something that would be a variable where you could have an, um, different, like a map, basically, where you'd have um, names and, and attributes, names and values that have associated metadata along with them also. For instance, maybe you wanted to store, I, I don't know, a credit card number and when the credit card expires with metadata as is expired. So the identity would go into an identity store, and that would be just what you'd expect. It's a store that's... Um, that would let you do CRUD, CRUD operations on identities, where you could you know, create an identity, delete an identity, update an identity. You could also do things with groups. Now, the reason why I have groups in here is groups has always been sort of a legacy thing with EE, where users and groups are always mapped. So this would provide you with a way of doing users and groups as well, where you could populate, um, put groups, put um, identities within groups. And the way that would kind of look is that you'd have an identity store and it would be backed by different repositories, depending on how it's configured. For LDAP, for example, for um, file, for database. And these would all be sort of, you know, these would all be standardized. And then you see server up there. Now what server could be, is server could be an adapter that lets you talk to, lets you access the actual server repositories. Only, of course, if the admin of the server allows you to do that. So that's just another idea. And then, um, of course, the, the product of the identity store is the identity. So how would that look? Well, you could have an attribute, an, an annotation that's um, like you know LDAP identity store with a Jindy name because it would be considered sort of a resource, and then you'd have some connection uh, details, and then the the schema for the LDAP could be something either sa standardized or customized, and then when you actually wanted to use uh, this identity store, you would just do like an at resource and look up that Jindy name, and then have um, the uh, identity store usable at that point. Other options are perhaps, these are ideas, um, an embedded identity store. Like let's say you're developing something and you just want to kind of quickly get some users and groups um, into your app. You could have something like an embedded identity store where in line you could define for development purposes um, identities with, with um, you know, users and, and groups. And of course, as I mentioned, there's the database identity store where um, you, know, you, would, you would supply queries that let you define, let you um, determine the attributes for the identity, and also have database connection details. Uh, the next API area I want to discuss is the um, password aliasing. This is um, specifically for applications that use passwords to access external resources like LDAP and database. And when I, when I mean um, connections here, these, these are outbound connections. This is as if the server is a client to an external server. These passwords are typically stored in annotations or in deployment descriptors. And of course, you know, you don't want to have things in clear, in clear text, so you want to have some sort of standardized mechanism to protect these passwords. So um, that's pretty much the goal with this, with this feature. There was actually a specific question in the survey about this. Should we add support for password aliasing, including the ability to provision credentials along with the, the application? And 57.9% said yes. Um, and this actually was a feature that was originally in EE7, but we, we moved, um, it didn't, um, they ran out of time in EE7 to do it, so it, we're revisiting it in EE8. 
So currently, there is no standardized support for this. There is proprietary server support. For instance, Glassfish supports this. And third-party security frameworks have, you know, have similar um, solutions for this, like, for instance, an embedded password encryption uh, in, the, in the, um, the configuration. Um, but I don't think they actually have something like aliasing. And the way this would look and work is like for annotations, for example, you'd have in this example a data source definition where the password would be this sort of regular expression, uh, sorry, um, um, not regular expression, um, uh, expression, language, ex expression language type of expression where the syntax would have an alias and then some key name. And this, in this case, it was password. And the key name is a key into the credential store. Um, and another example would be maybe in deployment descriptors. It, say in, in WebXML, if you want to have a data source, um, pass, you, instead of having the password in your data source and your XML, you could have, also have another expression where you would mention uh, you'd have the syntax of the alias and the key. And the way it would work is the, we would specify that the, um, the platform, the server, would have to, um, would have to resolve the, the alias it, it uh, you know, lazily, just, just in time, so that um, you can actually have the secret, um, the password resolve secret and use it, have it be usable for your connection. And then after it's done, the server could determine that and then just clear it up so that you don't have a password hanging around in your heap. And where this password alias archive would reside would be, uh, you know, in your resources of your deployment. Now, what this means is that if you wanted to have different aliases, different passwords for different deployment um, environments, you could do that too. For instance, you could create a password alias file for dev, for test, and for, for prod. And when you, um, when you deploy out to these different environments, you could swap out that file. And the keys are going to be the same, except that the resolution will be different based on where you're deploying it to. So it offers a little bit of flexibility in terms of, you know, passwords. So basically, it's just for configuration, annotations, and deployment descriptors. There's a secure credentials archive for bundling, these ar these, uh, bundling, bundling the alias and the actual password values with applications. We're going to specify that the uh, platform would consume these credentials upon deployment. And in terms of CRUD operations, how to update it, at this point, we're thinking maybe um, having these things be um, having some, specifying some tooling, you know, almost like a, a key tool and treating these files as kind of like a JKS file. So that's, that might be the approach for that. The next API I want to talk about is the role permission assignment API. Here, this is where an application, again, manages its own users and groups, and an application needs to assign these, um, needs to assign roles to these users and groups based on some application-specific model. So for, for example, you know, you, your app is, is uh, creating some users based on, say, the web API. You know, you have a new user, and you want to assign, assign uh, permissions to it so that they can use your application. Um, these users may be stored in an app-specific repository, as I mentioned earlier. And of course, users, these users, you don't want to manage these users at all with any type of server configuration. This is all going to be done within an application. So again, this is another EEA question, EEA survey question. Should we standardize group to role mapping? And 69.7% said yes. So this is actually a strong, there's a strong, a strong uh, desire for this, it seems like, in the market. There's no EE standardized support for this. This is the thing that's classically in the, uh, in the, uh, the platform-specific deployment descriptors, like in, in WebLogic, the WebLogic XML. Um, but, of course, third-party security providers do have their own APIs for this. So, I mean, there's, there's a solution there. So, the simple way to solve it is just to sort of standardize the standard deployment descriptors to have elements that do the mapping. So, for instance, have a security role map where you can map a group to a role. Another um, option, and this, is, this has also been kicked around, that um, a lot of people want to have it so that you don't have to do any role mapping. You want to have it so that the role is the group. And, and we would like to specify that that option be available also as a standard, where you can actually have another uh, configuration where you say, you know, group to role mapping false. And this way, every time you have a group, it's automatically the role. Another option would be having this embedded role mapper, actually having code, and if you wanted to, for development purposes, just right on the fly, create yourself a little role map and then have the permission assigned right there for testing. And then we have this concept of dynamic role map mapping. Now, this would be where you know, you're having arbitrary users being created because you know, they're using your API and your users are coming in, and you want to be able to, on the fly, either assign, a new, assign permissions to it or maybe upgrade um, permissions or downgrade permissions based on 
um, whatever reason, your applications aside. So we could define an, an interface for a role mapper. And the interface is pretty much what you would expect, right? You, have, um, you, want, you want to be able to grant a role to the user, revoke a role from a user. You want to be able to get the roles for a user. You want to be able to also grant roles to groups and revoke roles from groups and also get the roles from the groups, for the groups. So um, you know, it's pretty much what you'd expect for a dynamic role mapper. And it would be used by injecting, using CDI, injecting the role mapper into, you know, from the current context into your, into your uh, code. And then you could do all the oper operations I just mentioned you know, dynamically with the current runtime. So you could, again, you know, grant the role and, and uh, get roles for groups, et cetera. Um, the next API I want to talk about, oh, yeah? I, I, the API is not complete. No, no, I agree. I know, yeah, that came up in the extra group, yes. We're still working on the API. This is just an example of the, I guess really I'm trying to just demonstrate that we're, try, we're, we're looking in terms of dynamic role mapping and providing an API to do that. But you're right, yeah, some, sometimes roles would be in the, in the context of a, of a resource. Okay. So the next API is um, for security context. Now, this is um, when an application needs access as a security API, which is, you can obviously do right now, but this is more about centralizing it into one security API, um, one security context API. This is to get, do things like getting the authenticated user, like checking the roles, like being able to evoke, invoke run as. Um, you know, and, and also there's, there's a desire for an application to get the same API regardless of where they are in the platform. So you can have, again, access to security context wherever you are in the, whatever container you're in. There's no, general, right now there's no EE, Java EE support for this. Of course, third-party frameworks have support for this um, as a general uh, central security context. So for example, if you're in, 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 in an EJB and you want to find out you know, what is, is your current authenticated user in a role, you could, um, you, know, you have to go and use a session context to use that and call is caller in role. If you're in a servlet right now in current EE, you would have to use um, the HTTP requ uh, servlet request and call is, serv is user in role to perform the same action. If you're in a CDI bean, there's no such context, so you can't really do anything there in terms of that. And if you're in a JAXRS service, JAXRS has its own security context. However, it only applies to JAXRS. So now we have lots of different ways to do the same thing. So we want to introduce a centralized security context, which has basically, it looks like a, a bunch of convenience methods, but pretty much it gives you one API, one interface, to do all those things anywhere in the platform. So for example, uh, we could have it so that uh, you would inject the security context that would actually give you the context for your current runtime uh, environment, runtime context. And, um, and there you could call a method called isUserEnroll and to find out, you know, is your current authenticated user have a certain permission. And that same uh, context can be used in any, in any managed bean, CDI, servlet, um, EJB, JAXRS. And it would be one simplified uh, API. The last uh, area of ideas I wanted to mention is uh, authentication, authorization interceptors, an API for authorization interceptors. The use case here is uh, where an application needs to restrict specific um, methods to authorize users, obviously for authorization, and also that, um, an application, uh, that there are application model rules that are to be used for access decisions and where roles themselves are not sufficient. So this is the introduction of rules. There are, um, there was a survey, there were survey questions about this from EE8. Um, should we consider adding security interceptors in Java EE8? 78.6% uh, said yes. Should we simplify authorization by introducing an EL enabled authorization annotation? 66.7% uh, said yes. Our current solutions, well, EE authorization is really just rule based at, at the moment, um, not Sorry, I have no rule-based authorization, only role-based at the moment. But third-party providers do um, 
security, security frameworks, third-party security frameworks, do provide rule and uh, role-based APIs. So one way to solve this would be to use expression language, to have um, these text-based expression language rules that you can use to access the current context with managed beans, uh, managed beans the uh, security context, invocation context, and you can create more elaborate rules, right? You could have, um, and perhaps we'll call the, you know, this is all this ideas, but the evaluate secured annotation could have a, um, an EL-based rule where you could say, is my, in my current security context, does the authenticated user have the role manager? And by the way, does my, my, my look at the manage being the schedule, are we currently in office hours? If we're currently during business hours, you, it's okay to transfer funds. If you don't want to have text spread all over your app, because you can see how this could just be rules everywhere around your app, we could, uh, we could uh, standardize something where you'd have a, a rule repository, perhaps based on uh, LDAP, where we'd have um, um, a, a rule source name, here it's a Jindy name, and then you know, the, rule, the LDAP authorization rules annotation would have uh, some standardized or customized uh, schema that would allow you to store rules in a schema. And then um, if you wanted to um, activate the same rule, you could, do an, uh, um, you could use the annotation evaluate secured, provide the Jindy name for the rule source, and then have a key into the rule instead. Just, you know, so this way, if you do it by reference as opposed to having it in line. The other option that we were thinking of is using something called an access decision voter. And this is something I'm sure you've seen in other frameworks. Um, the access decision voter does pretty much the same thing. It's like a rule-based um, like rule authorization um, facility uh, that a user can define to make access decisions. And the way you use it is you just have something like an annotation, say, at secure, and you provide it with an access decision voter implementation. And then it does the same thing. If it, pass, if it, if it passes the um, access decision voter, you get access. And that, the way that access decision voter may look is that we would define a standard interface like access decision, decision voter. It would have a method called check permission, for example. And this is just an example. Um, within check permission, your implementation would have access to the current calling contest text, the, the security context, um, it just have access to whatever you may need to make that decision. And then its job is to say, do you have permission? And if you, you, um, if you say supply a security violation, then of course you don't have permission and the authentication, the authorization fails. So um, the next part I want to talk about is just how to get involved. If you see things that you um, think don't make sense, if you, um, if you want to contribute some ideas, um, you know, we, we really would appreciate it if you would just you know, let us know. We have a project page. This is a java.net page at the moment, but we have a project page which is a starting point of all of our uh, resources. If you go to that page, you will um, fan out to um, our, GitHub, um, our GitHub repository, our uh, JIRAs, you know, the spec itself. Um, we also have a users list. If you're interested in this, please subscribe. Um, this is a users list that gets automatic, um, automatic updates from the expert group, so you can listen to the expert group conversation. And then when you post to the users list, you'll get, um, you know, experts will listen in and respond to you. And also, we have a GitHub playground, which um, we appreciate if you want to donate any type of ideas. We have a, pro a proposal section. You can go into there and, um, and submit a proposal. And if you do so, I also just ask that you also add in um, a, users uh, an e uh, a message on the users list so that we have a reference to it and we have an idea of what you're thinking, you know, what your use case is, why you think, what we've, you know, why you think um, it's better or, has a, a, or maybe, um, you know, I don't know. So basically give us a little background about why you think that's a good idea. So that's all I have. Um, do you have any questions? All right. <laughs> any questions at all? I couldn't have answered all of your questions. There's no way. I have questions. <laughs> Okay, well, um, well, thank you very much for attending. Um, hopefully you'll see some progress on this in, in the coming months. Um, 
uh, it's always from from the Oracle standpoint. It's always you know our, our our model markers are always like you know Java one. So hopefully by Java one you'll see something significant in this. And um, um, well you know and hope you contribute. So thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, I have a question now. <laughs> um, I, I wonder what is. Um, suppose I, I am an implementer for um, a specific uh, authentication uh, and uh, uh, Sam uh, account uh, mm -hmm. orientation etc. mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, is it a good thing for me, as an implementer, a vendor, uh, to? Uh, to make uh, to, to make uh, something uh, for the G two E platform, I, I mean, if uh, it's uh, if I make a coupling with the G two E platform, I can't uh, make something uh, portable. I mean, uh, taking the, the same thing uh, in a, and uh, get it out and uh, put it in uh, in. Uh, I, I don't know in Play or in, uh, Spring or uh, old ver version of G2E, etc. I, I well, I, I think I, I would make uh, something uh, uh, very uh, applicative um, and uh, only a facade uh, to to stick it in uh, in the G2E interface because I, I want to have the. Uh, a good uh, spread of my uh, implementation, and uh, I want it to be available for uh, the maximum of platforms. So um, you want you want sort of uh, an adapter that allows you to adapt a server auth module into other platforms. It would have to be yeah, sort of. Like, wh you know, what is uh, the the why is there uh, more why it is uh, more valuable? To have uh, authentication and uh, mechanism uh, in the uh, as a, um, as something for a G two E platform specifically and not at the application level. It is. It is for the app. That is for the application. What I was describing, you can install just for the application. It would just be for the application. You can actually do what I mentioned with Jaspic and the server auth modules. There, I mean, at the at the server level, if you wanted to do something server specific, you can actually do. Um, there, there is. Um, different platforms have already APIs. You know, scripting APIs and also um, um, GUIs that allows you to just place in the SAM. Just place in the SAM, and it'll work. The point of the discussion. The, the point of the simplification is to make that available to application developers. Sam, um, Jaspic, as I mentioned, already supports the ability to have an application deploy a server auth module within the application. The problem is that it's hard. And the whole point of the simplifications is that we simplify that and so that, you know, instead of having to worry about those six classes, you just have to do like an annotation. Now, are we going to be portable across to Spring and to other types of platforms? I mean, it's the EE platform. I mean, we don't do that for other things, I think. I mean, I'm going to say no, no but I'm just thinking, yeah. you know, the standardization is the EE platform to go across. Yes, but uh, I mean, if, you, um, if you make something for the G2E platform, you have to embed the interfaces of the spec in, uh, in your jar. It's it's already there. The Jaspic's already there. The I mean, it, well, it will be part of the um, the the actual the actual interfaces for the simplifications will be part of the standard. Um, but so Jaspic, Jaspic is not in the G2E. It's oh yeah, it's Jaspic, uh, Jaspic's in J2E. Oh, I thought Jaspic's it was in. in oh, that, that's the whole point of. That's why I went to Jaspic. Jaspic solves most of the problems. All we're doing on top of Jaspic is, built, is making it simpler. Jaspic is already part of, um, it's standard in the full EE platform. It's optional in the, ser in the server web profile. And um, there's definitely pushes to make it more uh, um, mandatory on the, on the web profile, but there's definitely pushback. So, you know, it's not, not on every server, uh, on every web profile, but it's already there. And I mean, it's been there since EE6, actually. It's been there for a while. It's just that you know nobody's heard of it, <laughs> and and you know you don't really care if it's going to be too hard because it's like who wants to deal with it, right? But if we made it simple, you know, it's a facility that we can actually you know leverage and make uh, make useful. Um, and from the point of view of a simplification API, an API like ours, which is very um, you know app oriented, we want to build on what's out there already. We want to we want to start you know reinvent the wheel. We want to make it so that we just have to build the layer that's 
that makes it easier and just you know make it easier, make it quicker for us to get that done. No, yeah. <laughs> I tried to find uh, the, well, uh, actually, we, we all, um, uh, well, we, we will all want to have um, uh, this kind of uh, security concerns in uh, something like, uh, something you, you, you don't have to care at uh, each application you do. You, you want to just uh, take it and say, uh, okay, it's available. Right. But, uh, actually, well, I'm not okay. Sure. Oh, okay. The authentication mechanism definitely came up as being, um, you know, if you need an authentication mechanism, you need an authentication mechanism, and you're going to do what you need to do to get that in there. If you don't, you know, ba you know the server, the um, platform already supports, you know, basic and and ser ser uh, client cert and digest and form. Those are the basics in there, and there's actually a push within the servlet JSR to make those JASPIC SAMs, to actually make them SAMs. There's still, there's discussions going on right now because what, from the server point of view, they don't want to deal with it. You know, they, the, um, the EJB platform, the uh, EJB container, the server container, they're really happy there's going to be a security API GSR because they want to get that stuff out of theirs and have a VR problem. And, and there's definitely a push, as I, as I mentioned, to have all that, you know, when you see uh, in a web XML and you mentioned the auth method and you have a value in there, they want that to be a JASPIC SAM that kind of falls not within their, their camp. And the idea is as we go forward that maybe that auth method might become your generic, you know, your custom auth uh, JASPIC SAM that goes in there where you can actually place that into the web XML instead of basic or client auth. So as I understood, this specification is uh, specific to GEE platforms. This specification is specific to JEE platforms, right? Uh, it is an EE. It is the EE security API JSR. Uh, so it's geared toward um, the EE platform. Okay, and, and I think the question was why don't we imagine uh, an API more generalistic? Uh, oh, you want like push it into SE? Is that? Yeah, oh, instance. okay. I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't understand the question. Um, well, because uh, I guess we haven't really thought in that, we haven't thought about it in those terms. I mean, it's always the problem has been with the EE platform. The problem has been that in EE in general and the way you have these different containers, there has been um, this, this. You know, we have different platforms with different uh, approaches, and there has been this unity. Um, I mean, we can definitely explore it in the SE platform, um, but. Um, you know, I can't really speak to the SC, you know, what, what they have planned in terms of security. It's a whole different, you know, group, right? Um, I know that they're planning different, they're, they're planning change. I can't, I can't say, I really don't know about what they're doing. But I know that I've been involved in some um, SC security meetings over at Oracle, and there are definitely some changes that they're thinking of. But um, I can't, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's this kind of stuff. And the thing about the EE um, platform security is that you can define things like have, have LDAP annotations and have, you know, deal with databases and those are the kind of things you're not going to deal with in SE. Also, um, things like an authentic, um, like an, an, an OpenID Connect uh, authenticator, you know, that's, I think that's also a little too high level for, e, for SE. I, I'm not in SE, I don't know for sure, but I know that they like to keep things kind of really low level generic and then in EE you can do things like have um, pointers out to um, LDAP database and standardizing those kind of things, right? This is like the enterprise level. So, that's really been the focus of this, of this GSR. When we got these results of, um, from the survey, it was all for EE. It wasn't, nobody said anything about SE. Nobody's really, that was, that was not the focus at all for, for, um, for the responses we had that initially launched this GSR. So it's definitely um, you know, EE focused at this point. So, so but, but don't you think it will be a good idea to, to enlarge? I, I, I'll look into it. I definitely will look into it. I mean, as I said, I can, um, I can go back to the expert group and talk to them. Um, I can definitely see, investigate that. Um, but at this point, it's, at, at this point, it's EE. Okay. Thank you. Um, even if it uh, would not be a good thing to, uh, to, to, to have it in, uh, in uh, GSE, uh, it might be uh, independent of um, EE and uh, evolve as a 
standardized uh, API yeah, like, uh, like, that uh, uh, you can take in a standalone application? Well, let's take CDI for an example. CDI started out in EE, right? Yes, and, now, and I think they're pushing that into SE now, right? Um, or at least there's, there's some plans to do that, I think. Um, and um, so, yeah, we can certainly move toward that way if it makes sense. Um, I mean, this is just sort of an exploration of ideas. So we'll definitely look into it, you know. So, oh, question. Hi. Hi. Um, are there any SSO considerations being brought towards the think tank? Okay, so um, the closest thing to SSO that we've been discussing is this uh, OpenID Connect kind of thing, which is basically uh, OAuth 2, um, uh, um, an identity provider built on top of OAuth 2, right? Um, and that's actually quite popular because of, you know, all the REST-based things that are going on. Um, in terms of, say, something like SAML, you know, or Kerberos, it has come up in the expert group. Those would just be other authentication modules. Um, in terms of standardizing those, I mean, the only ones that really come out as being something that would be very valuable in terms of the standardization would be something that was more OAuth 2 based because, you know, this stuff's all moving pretty fast and things are getting old and <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, as a, a SAML, so, you know, XML. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, so far it's only been that. It has come up in discussions, but the, the, the real popular thing now is to do something that's more OAuth 2 based. So There also has been discussions about things like uh, identity propagation and identity federation. But, you know, we have about a year to create this thing, right? Um, the, the current um, EE8 schedule says that we have to release in Q3 2016. And, you know, you have a group of 14 people, or, whoops, you have a group of 14 people that are communicating via various means all around the world. You know, we're all, I think we're across maybe um, 11 time zones, the group. You know, so you know, I, I live in New Jersey, so when I wake up, Europe's already done, so I see like 20 emails, <laughs> you know. Um, so um, there's a lot of ideas out there, and we have a lot of ideas already that would really help. And to kind of go to the next level of, of standardizing identity propagation or identity federation, you know, at, um, at this point might be just something that we might want to wait till like a 1.1, 1.2 kind of thing. Because um, there's a lot of easy stuff we can do. Like all this stuff about authentication, simplifying authentication is easy. You know, a lot of the other things are just really a matter of just defining it and then that's it. I mean, there really wasn't a lot of stuff I showed you here, you know, in terms of what, what, what the kind of API changes. I mean, they're all kind of very thin. And if we can get that out, I mean, I think it would really help the platform. Oh, that's it. Okay, time's up. Uh, well, thank you very much again.